so uh, good afternoon good morning some of uh, those who are still in the morning and good evening for us in east africa uh today we are privileged to have dr emma bua who will be giving us a, a one of the seminar of one of the uh, most awaited especially for the african scholars because of the work she has been doing uh, I need to, I feel privileged to introduce Dr. Bua, being a lead sci uh, scientist at the National Museums of Kenya, where she's worked for a, a three decades and uh, mm. collaborated with so many uh, researchers and in sev a, a lot of projects where she, they have published uh, several peer-reviewed journals in collaboration with other scholars. She is the first woman in paleoanthropologist in Eastern African region. And she was the first recipient for the first Meridiki Award back in 1998 for dedication to human evolution research. Among other major milestones in her research is the discovery of the Australopithecus afarensis in Cantis, a site that is just one hour drive from Nairobi city, which is very close to Nairobi center, uh, city center. And uh, she recently uh, authored a resourceful book in prehistory study, which is the origin of humanity in Africa. And you, you can see this, I think it is available in Amazon, it's available online and uh, very user friendly, even for people who are not in the, in the field of paleoanthropology. So Dr. Emma, over to you. We're looking forward to listening to you and to learning more from you. And yeah, Karibu Sana. Thank you very much, Rehab. <laughs> yeah, listening to that introduction, I feel as if I'm ancient. <laughs> yeah, receiving my award in 1998. I'm sure most of you, you are in your youth. <laughs> Anyway, I'm happy to join you in the Mapping Ancient Africa platform. And uh, I want to thank, uh, to thank uh, the organizers of uh, this platform, William, Rahab, and uh, uh, your colleagues, the ones uh, I've forgotten their names. Uh, I know we are going to have a beautiful journey together in uh, mapping whatever has not been mapped so far, because as you, as we all know, you know, uh, research, uh, uh, various disciplines of research in Africa go way, way back, even in, uh, you know, more than 70 years ago. But uh, I believe there is still more which needs mapping and uh, which uh, I believe, you know, is the subject of this platform. So today I want, um, before I even move on, I'm a paleoanthropologist, you know, by profession, uh, working in the National Museums of Kenya with Rahab. And uh, I do research in the Pliocene and uh, also Pleistocene, uh, human, uh, early human uh, site. And today I will present uh, uh, a few sites which uh, have come into the light uh, just uh, in the last few uh, years or even months. I'd also talk about the site I've been uh, working in the last few years. So um, I want to begin by just reminding all of us that uh, Eastern Africa, you know, prides itself into, in having very significant uh, early human sites which over the years they have yielded a lot of uh, paleontological and paleoanthropolo uh, paleoanthropological uh, fossils. Uh, all this collection is under storage in various museums uh, within Eastern Africa. And many of these fossil sites, they range in age from the late uh, Neogene to Quaternary periods. I'm sure you, uh, our emphasis, uh, emphasis in MAA is uh, basically the quaternary, uh, but it's also you know, nice to go a little bit back and know what was there before uh, the quaternary. So while doing this, I want to bring out a site in Kenya which is very uh, important in that it has yielded 
the earliest early human fossils. Uh, that is a Kipsera man. Kipsera man is somewhere in central Kenya and uh, it has uh, yielded a, a fossil which dates to about 6 million years. For those who are conversant with the human evolution story, you already know there is another discovery in Chad uh, at Toros uh, Menalas, which is uh, older than what we have in Kenya, uh, about 7 million years. So these two fossils, uh, they are the earliest so far in the field of paleontology anthropology, uh, fossils which can be regarded as early humans. And I want to emphasize most of uh, this site, most of 95% of our East African sites, they occur along the Rift Valley floor. Um, uh, this is a map which uh, I have adopted, uh, adapted from Maslin and others in 2014, which shows lakes and basins uh, along the Rift Valley. And I want to just say that uh, most of our sites, as I said earlier, they occur along the Rift Valley uh, system. That's why, uh, where most of our research headed to, to look for new sites or everything. And it has been like this for so many, many years. I just want to mention uh, up north, uh, in the Afar region, that is in Ethiopia, uh, we have several early human sites there. Uh, for those who are conversant, there is a there is a, a Ramis which yielded the Hali, you know, a fossil which is also older in age. We also have Hada, we have Dikika and Woronzo Mill, uh, all in Ethiopia, and many others which I will talk about later. And then when you come down to southern Ethiopia, we have the Omo sites, which are very important because they have yielded early human fossils, uh, evidence for our species about uh, 200,000 years. And then from there, we jump into Kenya. Uh, most of our sites are confined around the Lake Trukana Basin. I don't know, uh, can you see the little, <laughs> there is a little strip there. I don't know whether it shows in my slides. Rahab, can you see? Am I able to remove this stripe? Or oh, I will just continue. I think, I think, I think it continue. looks fine. It looks fine? It looks okay, yeah. Okay, so in Kenya, you know, we have the Lake Trukana Basin. Uh, like Trukana Basin has yielded lots of uh, early human fossils, both on the east and on the western side. So close to 95% of our early human collections uh, come from the Lake Trukana Basin. And this basin has been, uh, has been researched for so, so many years. Actually, way back in 1967, that's when the research started there by Doc, uh, the late Dr. Richard Leakey. And uh, I want to say that uh, rich, the research is still continuing there, even after the pioneers have left, other younger people have uh, gone into the basin of, and have initiated different uh, types of research, not only paleoanthropological, but we have strong archeological programs also going, going on in the Lake Trukana Basin. So uh, again, in central Kenya, uh, as I said, uh, in Baringo, uh, near Lake Baringo and Bogoria, we have uh, the Kipseraman site, the one I talked about having yielded a fossil which is six million years, known as Ororin to go to Genesis. And then from central Kenya, we will go towards the south, uh, southern part of Kenya, Still, we are still along the Rift Valley. We find sites such as the Ologesaile, which is very, very famous in uh, archaeological uh, remains, particularly the Ashulian. And again, Ologesaile is very important in that it has demonstrated a shift from the early Ashulian to middle place to scene. Uh, that is work which was uh, published a few years ago. 
And then from Malagasela, we'll move on to Tanzania. Of course, all of you, you know about Old Vai God, the famous Old Vai God, which has yielded so many uh, fossils as well. Work there, of course, uh, we all know started uh, way back in 1959 by Dr. Mary Leakey and uh, Louis Leakey. And uh, 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 very near Old Vai God in the Serengeti, we have the Latoli site which is also very famous for fossils and uh, for some footprints, which uh, have demonstrated, you know, early human at this time were walking upright. So those are some of our sites, the major sites along the Rift Valley. So um, I will briefly just you know, go through these sites and uh, highlight what has come out of it. Uh, starting with Ethiopia, we have species uh, from Aramis and Gona, Adipithecus ramidus, very, very, very old, uh, about 4.4 million years. And then we are also male, we have uh, Ostropithecus anamensis from there and Ostropithecus afarensis. Uh, both of these species, uh, uh, you, they, they they were far, you know, they, their age ranges between 3.8 and 1.6. Of course, the Australopithecus anamensis is far much older, 3.8. In Hada and Dikika, again, Australopithecus afarensis. Lady Geraru has given us the evidence for Homo rudolfensis. This is the earliest with a big brain. And in Kenya, we have the same species. And uh, that's where we can trace the lineage Homo. Uh, probably around 2.6 million years. And then the earliest evidence of uh, our species, Homo sapiens in Ethiopia, it occurs in different sites, Homo, Homo, Alto, and Buia, uh, which have yielded specimens which demonstrate uh, the earliest morphology for humans. And then in Kenya, I just want to say this is a um, my, my slide here demonstrates an excavation in the western part of Kenya. Uh, this is the site where we excavated the Trukana boy, uh, the famous Trukana boy, Homo erectus uh, skeleton. And uh, generally, the Lake Trukana basin, particularly Kubifora, has yielded species such as Homo rudolfensis, the one we've just seen in Ethiopia. Homo habilis, Homo erectus, or between 1.9 and 1.5. And then we have the Paranthropus uh, boisei, uh, around 1.6 million years, and also Homo sapiens, that is the Kubifora, uh, the eastern part of the lake. Actually, Kubifora is so rich that you know we can count up to five species of early humans which have been recovered from there. And uh, from the western side of the lake, we have uh, sites such as the uh, Kanapoi and Alia Bay occurs on the east. These are two sites which have uh, yielded Ostropithecus and Amensis, uh, going back to four point, between 4.2 and 3.8. So these are some of the uh, second earliest, uh, oldest uh, fossils that we have in Eastern Africa uh, during that period. Lomekwi, as most of you know, has uh, yielded the earliest stone tools at 3.5 million years, and also some early human fossils uh, classified as Kenyanthropus platyops at 3.5. And of course, Kipseramon, uh, which I've just talked about, having yielded uh, Ororin to Genensis. The early human sites in Ethiopia, of course, we have Old Vigod, which has given us the uh, Paranthropus boisei, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, or between 1.6 and 1.4 million years. And then Latoli, as I said, again, very famous for the early human footprints. And Dutu, which is uh, Dutu and Eyasi, these are uh, quaternary sites which have yielded uh, earliest forms of Homo. Sapiens. Then, uh, having talked about the sites along the Rift Valley, uh, in the last uh, few years, uh, new sites are beginning to emerge outside the Great Rift Valley floor. 
on the eastern highlands and escarpment. So in my ne the next few minutes, I will talk about uh, this site and uh, talk a little bit more about my site, which is uh, the first one there, Candice Fossil Site. Apply on uh, apply us in sight, as I said, and uh, a site with your cars outside the Rift Valley on the eastern escarp escarpments of the Rift Valley. And the site is very, very near the Nairobi city. And then we have several other middle Pleistocene uh, sites which fits very well within uh, within our objectives in the uh, mapping ancient Africa. Uh, I'll just, uh, we have one known as Gobit, Guruwe, and Gatarakwa sites. These are sites which have, uh, have been discovered in the last uh, one year. And uh, they occur very, very uh, on the eastern side of the Abedeas and uh, not so far from Mount Kenya area. So these are all highland areas and we are beginning to see sites. Uh, you, uh, my colleagues are beginning, you know, to work there and uh, they are able to identify several sites. So what, that, uh, what does all this mean? It means that uh, while most of us were concentrating on the Rift Valley, uh, many more sites, you know, could be found in the escarpments outside the Rift Valley. And uh, I think uh, my colleagues work as well as my work uh, will uh, endeavor to find more sites uh, outside the Rift Valley. And uh, of course, uh, uh, previously, uh, all the information that we had in uh, early human evolution and uh, how they adapted their environments, all this was informed by research from within the Rift Valley. But now the information from the sites which are higher, which have a higher attitude, uh, we look forward into them providing new insights on how early human adaptation, uh, how humans adapted to highland environment and also the rest of the fauna because uh, other fauna, they have been also recovered in these sites. And just to mention uh, this middle Pleistocene sites, which are, uh, have been found, found in the last one year, they have yielded some scraps which uh, we believe are early human remains. But work is still going on uh, to, to identify further and also uh, do thorough uh, scrapping or uh, excavations of the particular areas where these fossils are found. Um, so any human remains, on these new sites outside the Rift Valley are very, very crucial to the debate and uh, 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 discussions which are centered on human evol evolution. So here, I just want to present uh, uh, a picture of, uh, this is a Nguruwe. This is Nguruwe and it's one of the sites which has yielded uh, a few fauna remains as well as the scraps, which uh, you know, uh, the PIs who are working here, who are my colleagues, they think could be early humans. So it's a site which is proving to be quite uh, important as time goes by. And uh, this one is Gobit also, uh, also very close to Nguruwe. And uh, future work will just be important in order to be able to recover all the fauna and uh, uh, see whether you know there could be any uh, early humans remains in such a new site. So um, I want now to spend a few minutes talking about my work in Candice. Uh, as I said, the Candice is a pliocene in sight and uh, is located very, very close to, to, to the city of Nairobi. Uh, this is a site which was brought to my attention by the owner of the farm. Uh, because me, like everybody else, my interests were in the Rift Valley in Kupifora and elsewhere. And uh, because we were meant to think that there were no other sites on the islands, mm. all our interests were in the Rift Valley. And uh, the owners of the farm 
uh, they noted that within their farm, there were bones which were quite dense, but they did not know exactly what it was. So it wasn't until the media in Kenya started highlighting documentaries which talked about paleoanthropology, archaeology, paleontology, that uh, this family, they noted that uh, those bonds which occurred in their farm would have been very important uh, to, to the National Museums of Kenya. And therefore, that's what they did. They came to the museum in the year 2009 and uh, reported the occurrence of a quite dense bone in their farm. So upon my uh, upon them reporting, we took a, a one-day survey to the area, which is a, a small river cutting across their farm. And uh, upon arrival there, we noticed lots of uh, hippo bones, quite a lot of hippo bones, which were lying on uh, the dry riverbed. And uh, some of it, particularly the lighter one, uh, they were eroded. But uh, much of it, because hippos are quite uh, big animals, uh, much of it was intact. And we noticed that uh, they were eroding from sediments on the banks of the river. So wow. upon my preliminary survey in 2009, we returned the, fo uh, the following year to do a bit of collection. And we were able uh, to collect much of what was uh, exposed on the surface of the river. Therefore, uh, Candice is a dense bone bed, and as I say, located very near Nairobi, uh, lying outside the Rift Valley system again. And the site, as I said, is a Pliocene site dating between 3.3 and 3.6 million. Uh, my slide on the uh, top right, uh, I just want to show you the location of Candice uh, relative to other East African sites, that is Kubifora up there, Lothagam and uh, Latole down here. And uh, my other map here on the, uh, on the bottom right is just to show the location of Candice relative to the National Museums of Kenya or the city of Nairobi. Uh, you can see Nairobi city center on the right top. And then the red dot is Candice Fossil Site, which is about 25 kilometers from uh, the city center. And uh, the, other, the other slide shows the thick bone bed uh, whereby we've been working on. So uh, it's quite a thick bone belt, but it has a uh, tafacious uh, layer uh, uh, also dividing uh, uh, two of the uh, fossil bearing beds, which I'll talk uh, about in a short while. So this is Candice viewed from the southern end of the site. Uh, while I was standing on a higher ground, you can see uh, the, the site down there with somebody laying there. And I want to draw your attention to the land surrounding Candice. This is within the private owned farms. You can see some animals grazing there. And this picture was taken in 2009 when I started work here. And I want to say that since then, so much building, Buildings have come up in this uh, privately owned land. And uh, you know, it poses a challenge to us because we cannot excavate much on a uh, privately owned land. So where we are, it's uh, along the river stream on the banks of the river because uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 in Kenya, there is the uh, repellian area which is owned by the government. And that's where we are confined at the moment. If we want to extend our work into the privately owned farm, then there is a need to negotiate with the owners of the farm. And sometimes uh, they require uh, that you buy the piece of land 
where you are going to do much of the excavations because they believe once you are done, that land cannot be used uh, for anything else. Neither can they build on it or even farm on it. So that is a challenge uh, to my research at Candice. At the moment, I'm still working on those uh, sediments which are located along the banks of the river. And this is the general view of the general uh, of the area, the town uh, nearby the site is known as Ongata Rongai, and uh, you can see people's uh, private farm, uh, private homes. The river just cuts across uh, what what you can see here in these homes, and we are down somewhere working. And uh, back behind there is uh, the famous Gong Hills for those who are conversant with Kenya. This is the most eastern uh, hills uh, when you are standing on the Rift Valley. So the Rift Valley is just beyond, beyond those hills. Now, this is Candice, same picture I showed you earlier. And I want to talk a little bit about the depositional environment. Uh, our geological and taphonomical work uh, indicate that the site was probably a watering hole or a Knoxbow lake back, you know, back at the time when uh, these fossils were, uh, were buried down. So lot, uh, we've uh, already through our excavations, we have uh, come across uh, numerous animal prints that particularly on the KF, uh, on what we call the KFS tuff, uh, we have seen lots of animal prints, uh, different species of animals. And then also we have uh, numerous hippo bones. As I mentioned early, when we went, we found hippo bones. And even up to today, whenever we do an excavation, there's lots of hippo bones coming up in the collection. And of course, we have other fauna species as well, uh, ranging from the, uh, you know, the macrofauna all the way to you might, uh, Ma microphone as well. So um, in Candice fossil site, uh, we identify at least three fossil bearing sediments. Uh, the top most, we have uh, named it level three. I don't know whether you'll be able to see my casa. Of course, there is the farm, the farmland. Uh, well, below the farmland, we find our level three, which has yielded quite a number of fossils. And then below level three, we have uh, our tuff, the KFS, Candice Fossil Site Tuff, uh, which divide level three uh, to the one below level two. I'm sure the, those who are conversant with a bit of archaeology, a, a bit of a geology, will be able to see, uh, to identify several layers of sediments here. And then we have um, a level, level two, which lies below the KFS tuff. And uh, I, before I move on, I want to say level three was deposited by a river. Uh, a very fast moving river because the sediments are quite coarse. We still find fossils here, much of it, they are fragmentary. Uh, but I want also to say in our level two, this, uh, the river was far much slower and the sediments are far much finer. And this is the level where we have uh, remains of uh, monkeys and uh, other smaller animals, which are uh, preserved very well in the sediments of our level two. And then below what you can see here, which we have not excavated is our level one, which overlies the basement rock in this area. So our fossil sequence, uh, our uh, our stratigraphy, the small stratigraphy we have in a, a, a Candice fossil site is the basement rock and then level one, level two, and then the KFS, the chaff, and uh, the level three, above which there are the farm 
uh, sediment. So it's important to note that uh, all the sediments were fluvial uh, sediments laid within a very, very short period. Um, this is just to show when work started before we even stung any excavations. We concentrated on scavenging, uh, on uh, collecting what, what was on the surface. As I said, uh, the owners of the farm, they noticed what was on the riverbed and uh, that's what formed uh, what the information that they brought in the museum. And therefore, upon our arrival, we collected what was on the surface. Uh, again, here, I just want to show you one of our excavations uh, in 2017. Uh, we've been working in KFS uh, since 200, uh, 2009. Every year we undertake an excavation for a month or one and a half months. So this is one of our excavation in 2013 continuing eastward. And as I said, you know, further than where we are now, if we excavated further than that, we would be on somebody's uh, private land, and that would require that uh, we purchase uh, that piece of land where uh, we would be working. Another thing to mention is that the fossil bearing sediments, they go deeper, even into the privately owned farm. So that is a major challenge that I'm facing uh, at the moment. Uh, here is just to give you a feel of uh, uh, when we collect things, we have to uh, we have to prepare them and case them in a plaster of Paris for safe transportation back to the National Museums. So this is one of those uh, exercises uh, protecting the fragile fossils by means of a plaster cast uh, for safety during transportation. But of course, there are those fossils which are far much, um, which are less fragile. So we usually transport them in a totally different way without so much uh, plaster of Paris. Uh, so um, what have I found, you know, from this uh, Pioneer site? Uh, so far, I want to say so far, I have undertaken nine excavations successively. And we have excavated an area uh, which, which measures 262 square meters. Uh, the fossils, the assortment of fossils discovered so far comprises of 29 species of uh, ancient animals, which range from megafauna to microfossils. And uh, we've been uh, quite fortunate to recover uh, the first evidence of Australopithecus appearances in Kenya. Uh, for those who are conversant, you know that Australopithecus appearances has been reported in Ethiopia, as well as in Tanzania, in Latoli, but uh, there was no evidence whatsoever from any of the Kenyan sites. So, Candice fossil site is quite important in that. This is where the first evidence of Australopithecus afarensis was uh, uh, discovered here in Kenya. And uh, we published the fossils in uh, the year 2016 by myself and uh, my collaboration, the people who have been uh, studying different aspects of the collection from uh, the Candice fossil site. So I just want to talk about uh, our numbers, uh, the numbers of the identify, uh, identifiable, uh, identifiable specimens from these sites. Uh, you know, my pie charts uh, compares the layer one, layer two, and layer three, uh, which, you know, uh, uh, they, they have yielded different uh, numbers of specimens. So, Layer one, uh, we find the hippos account for the highest numbers of the fauna, and it is followed by bovines. Uh, hippos are quite many uh, from this site, and bovids are also there. Uh, different uh, species of bovids have all been documented from Cadiz. And therefore, from level one, we also have suites accounting for 13 
percent. We are, we have other species in layer one, but they they occur in quite significant uh, numbers. As I said, this is uh, the layer which was deposited by quite a high uh, velocity river, high energy. That's what we call it, high energy river, and probably much of the specimens could have uh, been lost through uh, fragmentation uh, because the river also brought a lot of uh, uh, rocks and uh, that kind of uh, debris. And uh, layer two, our layer two, I said layer two contains uh, um, uh, finer sediments. And here again, you know, the hippos account for the highest number followed by followed by the bovids. And then here we encounter the primates. We have lots and lots of monkey teeth, which have, uh, which have been preserved in these finer sediments. And again, we have other several species of fauna also represented in that layer. And our topmost layer, layer three, we hippos still account for the highest numbers of uh, uh, specimen followed by bovids. And again, in layer three, we see uh, 2% of, uh, of the primates comprising mainly of different types of monkeys. So uh, from the entire three, uh, the three layers of uh, KF, KFS uh, stratigraphy, we find that the fauna is, con uh, the con uh, there is consistency in taxon distribution ac across all the layers. All sizes are represented. And uh, mostly our fossils, uh, what we have found comprises of the dendro remains of different groups, uh, different species of animals. And then we have large volume of unidentified fragments. Uh, once, uh, once again, uh, because of uh, the high energy river uh, during layer one and layer three. Just to take, to take you through a few slides uh, to show you the type of uh, fossils which we have recovered from Candice fossil sites. Uh, here is a large hippo skull, um, which we have uh, discovered from that uh, site. Uh, here we have almost the 80% of the skeleton of another hippo. <coughs> This skeleton was preserved on our layer two sediments. Uh, I said the sediments are quite finer, so much of the uh, different parts of the hippo were preserved on this, uh, uh, on this uh, layer of sediment. That is our level two. And then our highlight, the Ostropithecus sufferences uh, specimens. Um, I have a few scraps. I do not have a skull yet. It's my prayer that uh, as we continue working there, we will uh, discover something substantial in form of uh, a skull or a mandible. So I have a canine tooth. It's an upper canine tooth, which compares very well with the, the, uh, the afferences teeth, which are found in um, Hada in Ethiopia and Dikika as well as Latoli. Those are the Ostropithecus sufferences sites in Eastern Africa. So my canine tooth, this is an adult canine tooth, compares very well with that. And uh, then uh, the next, uh, on the same photo, I have um, two left baby teeth, two left uh, DM1, the baby molars. Um, I'm sure you can see there are four, but uh, it's just two teeth which have been photographed twice. So uh, it is two babies because it's uh, the same tooth from the same side. And uh, this is our baby uh, from Candice Fossil Site. Uh, I know for those who follow this field, we have a baby in uh, Dikika in Ethiopia. So 
our baby in uh, Candies compares very well with the Dikika child. And then below we have a full adult Alna, which we also found uh, from this site. And uh, this Alna also compares very well to the Alna in, uh, in Hada. Uh, uh, since most of you, you know, um, um, different parts of the body, uh, uh, from what people recover, you do not recover full skeleton. You uh, probably you discover one element and you uh, you don't discover another one, and therefore when we are identifying or trying to study the hominids, we have to under you know we have to know where to go. So in Hada there is a proximal ulna of the same species, Australopithecus afarensis, which was found there, and uh, we've done comparison with the uh, with ours and uh, the. Uh, they quite well compare. And because Hada is also 3.5 million years, just as the Candice, uh, uh, that we were able to determine that uh, our, our collection, our early human collection in uh, uh, Candice were indeed Australopithecus afarensis. And of course, the teeth helped quite a lot. So what is the broad in, uh, implication for this highland site. Uh, I want to say that uh, these sites will extend early hominid range to highlands outside the Rift Valley. As we said, much of the research has been confined on the Rift Valley, but uh, the new sites occurring away from the Rift Valley uh, extend the range for the early hominids uh, to highlands the uh, environment. So the additional scientific insights from the non hominid fauna, uh, which we've recovered from this site, uh, also uh, they will provide important uh, information into high, uh, and give insights into highland paleo habitat. Also, this information from the new sites will uh, provide insights in selective pressures and adaptations of the highland ecosystems uh, during the Pliocene period. Uh, further, it provides good reference data for comparative studies with other sites, particularly those in the Rift Valley, and for testing episodes of major turnovers, uh, fauna turnovers documented in the Lake Tukana Basin and the lower OMO group by different uh, workers. More broadly, KFS will uh, provide additional database for testing the selection variability, which was advanced by POTS in 1999, and the Savannah hypothesis in highly hominid evolution. So the, the information from these sites are quite crucial in uh, contributing to what others have already put forward. And having said that, I uh, just want to appear, highlight just the, uh, in addition to what I said, the limitation in extending our excavations to pri uh, private homes. Uh, we have encountered times when uh, it rains upstreams when we are still in the field and then you know the river gets flooded quite easily and then we have to abandon our excavation. So. This was one time when it rained upstream without our knowledge and water came and uh, flooded our excavation. Uh, another challenge, it was uh, moving out of uh, uh, that area to the main road. Uh, that was also quite a challenge. We had to push our vehicle up. And uh, for every hard work, I think uh, people need to sit down and relax a little bit. So. This is our. This is us having a cup of tea after uh, working very hard on the sediments. The site was not very far from our mill uh, area, and uh, we walked here for tea and uh, lunch uh, because you know we stayed elsewhere. But uh, all our meals were done here in the field. So this is uh, one of those uh, moments. 
And uh, the end of one of our excavations in the year 2013, uh, 2017, this is my crew. The people have been working with mostly comprises uh, the assistants who work in the Department of Earth Sciences in the National Museums of Kenya and uh, the local people from that area. We also recruit them to give back. So uh, with that, uh, I want to acknowledge a few funding agencies, Leakey Foundation, Wenagrain Foundation, the National Geographic Society, Paleontological Scientific Trust, and the National Research Fund here in Kenya. And finally, the Mapping Asian Africa organizers for the invitation to speak today. Asante Sana. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Emma, for that uh, very informative talk you've given us for the uh, who are present, who listened, and if they have any burning questions that they need to ask, uh, please feel welcome. Raise your hand, and then we can uh, answer. She can answer your question. Or maybe you can put your question in the chat. Uh, Aldo Adam. Uh, thank you. Can I go ahead? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you uh, for this nice uh, presentation. Um, what I want to know is um, the high number of uh, hippopotamus uh, fossils uh, in relation to the uh, hominids. What uh, inference does that uh, say about the environment and uh, whether the uh, the presenter was able to link those uh, associated artifacts uh, in the in the in the, in the in the site, or can something tangible be said about the association of the high number of hippos as well as um, uh, in relation to the hominids uh, fossils? So what can we say about that and how can that uh, inform us about uh, the ecology of the area? Thank you. Okay, Emma, over to you. Okay, thank you very much for that question. Yeah, uh, during my presentation, of course, I talked about the high number uh, of people collection. Also, when I talked about uh, the deposition environment, of this site, how it was deposited, how those sed sediments and where they were deposited. Uh, we have in uh, evidence that uh, it was uh, deposited into a water hole, not a, not a lake at, uh, for that matter, uh, meaning that there was a, a small form of a water hole or an oxbow lake you know, Oxbow's Lake from where the river meanders. So all the sediments at KFS, they were deposited in that kind of a paleo environment. And as we know, uh, mm -hmm. it is uh, most likely to find lots of hippos in that kind of a uh, uh, setup. Hippos, of course, live in pools of water, in small lakes, and that kind of uh, uh, set up. So Candice uh, may have been a, a water hole and therefore the high numbers of uh, hippos is a good indication that uh, there was water uh, in the area. And for the number of uh, early humans, uh, I think we all know that uh, even in the sites along the Rift Valley, uh, the uh, human, early human fossils are usually a small fraction of all the rest of the fauna. You might find uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, antelopes or other, you know, uh, groups of animals. Yet, you know, finding early humans uh, is quite an uphill task. And because, you know, uh, the groups of early humans were quite small. They weren't as abundant as other animals. And therefore, 
uh, it, it, in fact, finding a human fossil in every given site is usually a big blessing to the group of researchers working there. Because uh, as I said, uh, the, the early humans were quite uh, small numbers in every given environment. So I don't know whether I've answered this question or there is something else which needs clarification. Yes, uh, sorry, what I'm saying is um, perhaps um, you can link uh, the human fossils with the hippos. Is there any link? Uh, I don't know exactly what you mean by a link, but I, these are all uh, uh, living creatures occupy the same environment. Of course, the, the humans mm -hmm. are not living in the lake, but they are utilizing the lake probably for the water, or even they might have died elsewhere and washed down by the river. So the link, I can only think about is uh, this. Uh, 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 this is the same. Uh, uh, let me call it. This is the same environment where animal, different types of animals are living. The hippos in the lake, the early humans are living probably in the in the grass uh, in the woodland or the grass which is surrounded uh, this lake. So that's the only link I can uh, talk about group of animals living at the same time, because every, uh, the fauna from KFS, uh, it's all dated to 3.5. So the link is uh, animals living at the same time period. So I don't know, <laughs> uh, I'm not- yes, uh, that, 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 that is okay, thank you. It's okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank, thank you. you, yeah. We also have a question from Will. He's asking, can you say something about how the sections were dated? Um, we did a potassium argon, uh, which was done by Professor Frank Brown in uh, his lab at the Utah University. And then we also did paleomag, a magnetic uh, type of uh, dating, uh, that one was done in Japan. So the two mm -hmm. complemented each other into the uh, into coming with a, a date ranging from 3.6 to 3.3. So the three... Great, thank you. Yeah, and, and also maybe Dr. Emma, you could say something because in layer one, we see it is quite different from the rest of the layer, layer three and layer two and layer three, and especially the presence of the sweets in layer one and uh, the absence of the can tell you, can tell us uh, something about the age, the geological period you are dealing with uh, while mm -hmm. starting before mm -hmm. the absolute dating. In a presentation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, layer two. As I said, uh, um, layer two was uh, deposited 